Okay, so how did I uh, how did I get to do what I'm doing? And uh, I think uh, um, from when I was really young, I just remember. I mean, first of all, I was surrounded by media, just books and television and music and um, just everything. And um, and the way I responded to all of that is that um, that I wanted to do it too. So I wanted to I wanted to make TV shows, and mostly I love animated films. I mean, animated TV shows. I wanted to make cartoons. I wanted to make movies. I wanted to write books. I wanted to make music. I wanted to do everything. You know, that's I saw those things. I was affected by them, and right away I wanted to create dialogue. I wanted to I wanted to have my say um, in that. You know, I didn't didn't want it to just be one way where all this media was was going at me. I wanted to I wanted to send media back. I wanted to do things. And so um, when I was when I was pretty when I was really young, I would put on puppet shows. I would make puppets, put on puppet shows. Um, as soon as I learned how to read, I made my own books. You know, I would just um, my father was a Lutheran minister, and uh, in his church office, I would just hang out sometimes after school. And um, or even before went to school, um, but um, and and there would be blank pieces of paper or the other the flip side of the bulletins that you know there were extra bulletins they were printed on one side from the from the head office in Minneapolis and um, and on the other side they were blank if you didn't mimeograph the you know the program for the day's uh, services so I would have these one-sided pieces of paper and I would make books out of them and I would sell them on the playground when I was little. And, um, and then um, as soon as I, uh, when I was nine or so, uh, a neighbor uh, gave uh, me his eight millimeter camera, um, which was just sitting in his attic. And, um, and actually I made a little comic about that, so I'm gonna show it. If it uh, sure, if, um, sure. I mean, I can, I can hold it a little closer, but no, it's basically it's, um, you know, uh, I did a little comic series about my discovery of 8mm film, and um, I just remember getting that camera in a paper bag. It came in a paper bag. It, uh, it, it came from his attic. It was in the attic, and just kind of sitting there in the attic for a long time. And, um, and I just remember just, it was like the most amazing piece of uh, thing that I ever, ever saw, this camera. Um, it was a brownie 8mm camera that was made in the 50s. Um, so I got it, you know, twenty some years after the camera was was made and sold originally, and um, and I just wanted to figure out how to use it, how I could make movies with it. And I, um, it was a clockwork camera. You had to wind up, wind it up for it to work, um, and um, and it would, you know, shoot film for a little while. So I wanted to make animated films. So I I took the camera, set it up on a tripod in my basement. Uh, made some paper cutouts that I moved around, and of course I didn't know about lights, so I, I didn't have it. I didn't uh, uh, um, um, basically there was no light on it, so basically the whole roll of film came back black. So the next thing I, thing I did was just take the camera outside with my brothers, my brother and sisters, and had them dance around. And I did magic tricks with them by having them scan, and then I'd stop the camera, have them move out, and film again so they would disappear. And um, so that was like the the first real movie I made that actually turned out, and probably my my um, favorite movie ever, <laughs> was what I made in my first movie with that camera with my brother and sisters. Um, and so that was just the beginning of a, uh, a lifetime fascination with telling stories visually through through movies. Um, and um, first on film, then video, and um, and. Um, and making animated films as well. Um, so I, I started. I started really early, just kind of making things because I, I, I loved to and telling stories. You know, basically some of them were the stories of the things that were around me. You know, my family, my my town. Um, I was. This was in Wyoming uh, when I got that camera. I was living in a small town in Wyoming, and so I started making. You know, what I found out later was really documentary films, although they were kind of always. Documentaries that I would I would um, uh, um, you know basically kind of direct you know I would direct my, my family and friends in them but there were really stories of that place and then I, I started making animated films first with paper cutouts then with clay figures and um, um, kind of inventing inventing stories and making movies and 
and really that's what I've, I've done since. And, and as well, I've written those books, like those books that I wrote in first grade. So I've kind of kept on creatively doing all of these things over the years. And, um, and, and eventually being able to make that into a, a career. Um, you know, I do, I still do documentary kind of productions. I do, uh, uh, my, my partner Beth and I work together and we do films, videos for nonprofit organizations, um, um, for anyone, you know, who will hire us. I mean, what I really like to do is go to events, videotape things, do interviews, and then cut them together to kind of tell the story of that event um, in, in, a, in just a few minutes. Uh, and we also do some animation. And I also do animation on my own. Um, uh, projects that I've been working on, uh, lots of shorts and then animated feature projects as well. And I still continue to write. I write stories about, um, you know, I just I make up silly poems. I mean, I'm really, um, I'm really doing a lot, uh, really doing what I did when I was really young. Um, last year, my my mother passed away, and um, and we were going through stuff. So I, I made all these little books when I was when I was in first grade and I first second grade and I um, I thought I sold them all on the playground and I didn't I didn't have copies of them anymore I thought they were completely vanished they were gone from the world and my mother had a whole bunch of them <laughs> that she had saved and it was kind of amazing looking at them because it's it's really not much different my, my drawing style hasn't changed a whole lot. And, you know, the stories are silly like I do now. I mean, I'm, I really haven't changed a whole lot. I, I started doing this when I was young and I'm still doing it. And, and um, you know, definitely mostly doing it like I did it then for the love of it, you know, and not, you know, and, um, actually make a living doing film and animation now. But it's, um, but, you know, mostly I do it because I, I love to do it and I want to do it and I kind of need to do it too. I think it's just always necessary. It's all that media. It's my way of creating that, continuing that dialogue, you know, my way of dealing with all the, the images and the sounds and the stories that are coming to me from, um, from the corporate media, from, you know, from other artists, from things like that, and kind of thinking, okay, I want to have a bit part of that dialogue and I want to send some messages out. So I started young. Uh -huh. How come do you think that you, when you saw television, books, comics, wanted to make them, and the kid next door maybe wanted to consume them? <laughs> what is it that makes that difference? Was yeah. it a family thing, or a neighborhood thing, or something? in your DNA, or how do you think it happened? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I definitely love books about people making things. So when I was, you know, getting into filmmaking, what I, um, there were a couple books in the library that I really young, loved, and one was called Young Filmmakers, and it was about um, uh, young people, you know, pre-teens, and then teens, who were making their own films. Back then it was with 8mm and Super 8, 16mm. And so I got that, that influence, you know, okay. I just, I just loved that it was kids like me making films. There was also a book called Young Animators, which was the same thing, it was young people making animated films. So there were some, some examples like that. Um, I think, I think my, my need to do those things even predates those examples. I mean, those definitely made me see that it was possible to do it. But um, to me, I, I think, I think just, Seeing the media, always seeing a, a film or something like that, always makes me think about how I could, how I could do something like that or do something different than that. And and, um, and I don't know if I had examples for that. I mean, you know, I, I'm, in my family there weren't, you know, I mean it was, you know, my my parents in there, um, uh, you know, maybe not. My father was a minister, and so he had to take these stories and tell them every 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 week, you know, in front of in front of the congregation. So maybe that there was something of that. I think, you know, my father being a minister really influenced me and in, in, um, in, in my, you know, I do a lot of teaching now too. And just, it is, that's what it is. It's telling stories to people and, and engaging them. You know, it's not just telling stories, but it's kind of having, you know, 
real teaching is, is creating a dialogue with the people that you're you're teaching and, and kind of sharing that experience. And um, yeah, that example of my father was important. I think um, that just my, my, my parents, and maybe my mother especially, um, surrounded us with really interesting books and records and um, and and which were all very inspiring you know I think you know and encouraged us to do arts and crafts kinds of things so um, so it all kind of came came naturally um, so yeah I think you know but definitely there were things um, like those books also there was a show on, on PBS called zoom um, that came out of Boston that would always feature uh, 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 a youth-made film in it. Um, there was an animated film or a film with actors, and, and seeing those films, of course, made me want to make my own films. There were both. So there were examples all over the place, but, um, but it was probably something, too, in my DNA that made me want to create. Um, I, you know, once again, after my mother died, I found that she had lots of stuff that she had written. She had a sketchbook of drawings that she had done, so I think that, I mean, I think it is in the DNA that there are, you know, that I got from my mother, my father, probably that, that urge to be, to be creative, to want to tell stories, to, um, to want to um, kind of frame the world, see the world and present it to others mm -hmm. and be part of that dialogue. So for, for animation and maybe also for film, what were your early models? What, what sort of stuff did you find cool in a way that you'd say, I want to do that? Yeah, well, I just, I just remember one of my favorite things to do was on Sunday morning, it was, you know, syndicated, was the repeats of the, of the Bullwinkle and Rocky shows. Yeah. Those just had a very deep influence on me. Not only, I mean, because of the, maybe the simplicity of the drawing, the recognizability of the figures, but more than anything else, just the silliness of it, you know, just the, 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 um, the those films, those, those TV shows, um, just reveled so much in, in the awful pun, and in, um, in, in goofiness, in silly voices. I mean, I, um, you know, as I got older, I read more and more about how those films were made. It was, it was really, it was Bill Scott, who was the, um, the director, and who wrote many of the scripts, and who was also the voice of Bullwinkle and the voice of Dudley Do Right, and June Foure, who was the voice of Rocky the Squirrel, and um, there were several actors who would do a lot of imp improv as they recorded their scripts. They would have fun with it. They would make uh, silly voices, you know. And um, and then and the animation was simple and cheap, and there was something about that that was. Um, because the animation was simple, the character design was simple, I think that, that said to me, you know, that I could draw too, and I could make silly things, and I could put it together, like, you know, something like that. So there was something about, you know, you see a Disney film where the animation is so, I mean, it's made by these huge assembly lines of people, um, just hundreds and hundreds of people to make this film so perfect. And, um, but that also makes it so alien and so like, that's something that's impossible to, to create. I could never make a Disney film. I could make a Bullwinkle show because it was it was done a lot simpler. Um, it was done maybe a little more sloppily, uh, and that's I love those things about it. You know? So, so that was really influential to me. Um, and then just um, and the same with you know just every like so there are so many books I remember just. You know, I, I loved Lewis Carroll so much when I was little. There was something about those silly, the silly, um, uh, uh, the, the kind of the free associative qualities of what, what he would do. Or he would like just completely put strange ideas together and make make something that was just so beautiful, you know. And um, and that that was something that just I just loved and um, you know wanted to. And and today I just love writers who are who are are just can go a little crazy. I mean one of my favorite writers is Raymond Kino, the French writer who wrote Exercises in Style, which is the same incident repeated over and over again in lots of different styles of, of writing, um, different ways of reporting that little incident back, you know, just kind of being absolutely crazy. And um, it's the crazy writers and, and, and the simple artists, you know, who really influenced me I think the most.
I mean, Rocky and Bullwinkle also has the advantage of being pretty short episodes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One can imagine finishing one of those, but yeah, uh -huh. probably not Dumbo quite so easily. Yeah, yeah, and there's something, and, and then the Rocky and Bullwinkle, so many elements of it are reused every week, <laughs> you know, which is one way that they were able to, um, you know, produce the, the episodes kind of quickly. You know, there were so many little inter interstitial parts that were used over and over and over again. Um, when I was uh, teaching myself how to use uh, the Flash animation software, I decided I was going to make a serial. I did a serial called The Monkey Mugs Make Media Magic, and, and my goal was to make a new episode every week, you know, and I, so I used a lot of those Rocky and Bullwinkle techniques to, to, you know, with a long opening sequence and long ending sequence and then, you know, the short episode in the middle. So part of it was already done every week when I had to make one. So, and, then, and I would do all the voices and of course I would make all the characters and do everything um, you know, basically myself, like like Bullwinkle, which was a very small, a very small crew, kind of doing everything. I mean, it's you know, Jay Ward gets all the credit because he was a producer, but it was really Bill Scott who was the mm -hmm. director, and he designed many of the characters, and he um, he basically storyboarded out most of the episodes, and also just did the voice work, and so that was that was an example that was really uh, important to me that it was the person who drew and wrote but also did the voices, the silly voices, and that's something that I do with my cartoons. I, I, uh, I, I kind of just enjoy doing all of that. I also make music. I played, you know, I played the clarinet when I was in, in, uh, in junior high and high school. So, so all of my animated films have my, most of them, sometimes I get other musicians, real, real musicians who actually know how to play to do music, but in many of my films I do a little quicker. You know, it's me playing the clarinet or me playing my little keyboard or, you know, or me just making sounds with my mouth too. Just um, um, so, but that that model came to me from from Bullwinkle most of all. That, you know, doing all, taking you know, just a small group of people, or maybe one person doing all those roles. So, what kind of time do you devote to a piece? Is it a matter of throwing something together quickly and then going on to the next one, or are you painstaking and perfectionistic about it, or how do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, um, I mean, maybe a little bit of both, but I mean, I, I call my own, my personal projects, like the, the films, I call them sloppy films, that's my, my film, sloppy films. And, and partly that's um, to get to kind of escape perfectionism. You know, I can, uh, there was a time, um, you know, I. Uh, after I, I, I went to film school, actually I spent a couple years in chemical engineering and went to film school and, and, and learned how to make films on 16 millimeter. And, um, and I had lots of ideas and made a lot of starts on things, but I never finished them. You know, I would like start making a movie and I would film part of it and I would just never, um, I would never finish it. You know, and, I, and partly that was, you know, Filming on film on 16 millimeter film, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an expensive, expensive process. You have to buy the film, you shoot it, you send it to the lab, you get it back, you have to edit it. Um, you have to figure out how you're going to do the soundtrack when the film and the sound are separate elements. And so I would never, I would never finish anything. Um, when I started working in video, I, um, you know, I could, it was the the process was a lot quicker, and I found that, um, you know, I could also. But I could also just not finish a project either. I could start it, and I could get ambitious, and I could like decide that oh, I just can't, I can't make it the way I want to do it, and I would never, I would never finish it. And I just decided that I just need to finish things, and they didn't have to be perfect, you know. And and um, and I, uh, uh, I, I started watching the films of uh, Reiner Werner Fox, uh, of, um, of the uh, German filmmaker uh, Foss, Fossbinder. And he had a quote where my, my method of revision to, is to go on to my next project. And that kind of helped to free me up too, that okay, you know, I'm not just making one movie, I can make lots of movies and I have lots of ideas, so I'll just keep on making more. And, and as I make them, hopefully they'll get better or at least they'll change. And so I just decided that okay, I'm gonna do something and I'll eventually finish it and then I'll move on to the next project and you know, revision is good, but um, but it's not the whole point. The reason I'm doing it is because I have I have this idea and I want to express it, and and um, and then eventually I'll get tired of it. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be that perfect movie that I had in my head at the beginning. Um, but I'm just going to go ahead and do it anyway and, and get it over with and finish it. 
of course, doing it that way, then, you know, I mean, my big problem is that I haven't, I haven't spent a lot of time trying to get my work out to people. You know, I just, I make things, put it online. You know, I write my books, and most of them no one even reads. But, um, so that's the next step, is trying to get, to get, to get my work out. But, um, but mostly I do it, like I said, I do it because I love it. I want to go on to an, another project and just, just mm -hmm. keep on doing it. So, what have you found as satisfactory outlooks when you have been able to get your work out? Yeah, well, I mean, it's like when you're talking about movies, it's always nice to be able to present it to an audience, you know? So, so I've you know, had, had some screenings, and, um, and kind of one thing, you know, I mean, when you're making independent films, small films, one of the, the best ways to get it out is through film festivals. Um, so of course I make movies and I send them on to festivals and often I get rejected. Sometimes I get in and then if you go, are able to go to the festival screening and see it with an audience, that's always an amazing experience. And um, so one of the other little side projects I started doing was I decided that you know Minneapolis, St. Paul, we're a pretty good sized community here and there, there are people making animation and a lot of people like me who are kind of doing independent animation and kind of doing projects on their own, but there just aren't a lot of, you know, you can send them to the other, you know, there's lots of film festivals here, but, you know, they don't know animation or they're not, they don't understand independent animation, you know, they, they see animation in terms of very, very slick professional kind of things done by teams, and there's really no good venue for people who are just doing stuff a little more wacky, a little more way out, a little more independent, and so, so I started a little, it's not really a festival, but it's a yearly showcase called Minanimate, and so I, um, so I've kind of created this venue where I can show a piece of mine and then collect all these other great animated films that are made locally. And it's the second Thursday in September. It's been it. Um, the fourth one was just a, a few weeks ago. Um, but um, you know, just doing doing that. Um, for a long time, I made work and put it on public access television, which was great because you'd have um, an audience, but um, but I, you would never hear the, the response of that audience. You know, you'd never know what people really thought about your stuff. Um, so the nice the thing about putting together this little Minanami, a little showcase festival every year, is that um, that there is some engagement with the audience. We have a Q&A afterwards, so all the animators. And every year there's like maybe 15, 20 of the people who made films up in front at the end um, having a conversation with the audience. And hopefully that continues afterwards too a little bit, you know. So um, because it is really, you know, I mean, it's... Um, that, you know, I, I make things because I want to be part of that conversation, but I want the conversation to come back to me too from the things that I made, you know, um, which is both good and bad because I, I make things and I put them out and of course people see them and then they judge them and maybe sometimes they judge them, they like them, but sometimes they judge them, they don't like them, the things that I do and that's, and sometimes that's difficult to kind of face um, because sometimes I, you know, I have, I have ideas that they might not agree with, you know, um, they maybe just don't get what I'm doing, you know, with that, that happens a lot. That's why I do my own thing, because I, you know, I have my own ideas of what I want to do and how I like to see it. So, so it's both good and bad. It's great to have that audience and that audience liking what you're doing. It's also, it's also in a way it's good when the audience doesn't like that because it's kind of a growth thing. Um, but it's, it's also kind of difficult for me because I, you know, I'm, uh, I uh, yeah don't have the thickest skin. So. Yeah, I've I've been running for years from any sort of feedback on my stuff. I got myself pretty effectively insulated. <laughs> uh, every so often, someone recognizes me by voice, but it's pretty rare. Mm -hmm. uh, how's the streaming environment worked for you? Have you done? Have you used that as a way to get your stuff out? YouTube yeah. and such. Yeah, no, that's pretty amazing. I mean, that's something that's completely, you know, I mean, the te technology is, you know, I've, I've been around for like five decades and just what I've seen, you know, in those 50 some years is pretty amazing how, you know, how it went to, when I made a movie, you know, I made an eight millimeter film, I would show it in my basement, you know, to a couple friends, my family. Every once in a while I would bring, um, the film and my projector to school and show it to my classes, you know, show it to my class at school. But that was it. You know, I have all these films I made as a kid and they're mostly in my basement and, you know, no one, no one can see them. Now I make something 
Um, sometimes I can I can make it. I can put it online. I can send out a link on Facebook, and people watch it immediately. They can watch it right away. And um, you know, I don't have huge audiences watching my stuff, but I but I but I but people do watch my stuff online, and that's that's uh, um, that's a pretty amazing democratic um, distribution uh, thing that just didn't exist a few years ago, and um, and and which I really I mean I'm, it's it's a pretty amazing thing to have. So so I do I do use it. It is once again it's there's that that um, that that you don't get the dialogue. You know, not like when you actually physically watch your film with an audience and and then get their immediate response. You know, you um, um, you um, it's kind of a vacuum. You know, you put things out. Of course, on YouTube there's comments and and I, you know sometimes the comments are. I mean, it's not like people comment on my stuff a lot, but sometimes there are comments that are like really just really mean spirited. You know, so that's a little hard. Um, but um, but. I just love that ability to be able to just put things out like that. Any temptation in the direction of having a real Rocky and Bullwinkle kind of organism thingy? I mean, a weekly show? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've I had I did I have done a couple s serials, you know, um, and and I've made um, I'm kind of finishing up my third animated feature, so I've done some bigger some bigger projects, you know, but, you know, I still like to do it all by myself. I'm not going to get a big crew to do my things. I mean, I, you know, I just, I, I value, um, I mean, okay, let's think about this. You know, there are, there's so, if you look at art history, there are um, so many artists who work on their own, right? There are very few artists who work with a big crew. I mean, Michelangelo had his, not Michelangelo, but, um, um, Rembrandt, you know, had his school and they worked together on paintings, but most artists, you know, typically kind of worked alone. There was one brain onto that canvas, one brain that wrote that um, score. Um, so when you, when you have a film coming out and you have um, basically all the early filmmakers basing the film production process off of the Ford Motor Company assembly line, which is exactly the model that Disney used, the, the model that Thomas Ince used, the people who basically developed the, the way the films are made today. They were basing this, this model, they were making, their model for how films were made was the, was the brand new assembly line that Henry Ford developed to create the automobile. So what they did is took all the, those little parts of that process that, you know, and traditionally, if, 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 um, if Van Gogh was making movies, he wouldn't be the director and have a screenwriter and have a cinematographer and, and, a, uh, and a makeup crew and, and set crew and all that. He would do the whole thing. You know, he was making movies in 1880s, you know, from his asylum room, you know, for example, um, if that was even possible. But the early filmmakers developed a system for making movies that was based on the assembly line process, taking every little piece of the project, of the process of making it and giving it to a different worker. So someone would do this, you'd pass along to someone else. And that was the mo that's the model for making movies that I grew up with. And, um, and, you know, I decided I don't want to do it that way. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to be like the traditional artist who is, you know, basically working alone or maybe with, with another, with maybe a couple trusted people to, you know, like to, you know, if Michelangelo's painting, maybe someone's like, oh, down here, oh, do this, do this, do this. You know, I mean, that's how I work. I get feedback, you know, on things that I do, but I'm basically, I like to work alone. And even if I'm doing a big project, I want to at least do the animation work, or the you know the, the kind of that, that major work by myself. That's just the model that I I, I embrace and want to do, and you know, that's how I want to do it. So I'm probably not going to do a big crew to do like a weekly show. That's just not what I want to do. So what kind of partnership arrangements have you been able to work out with your spouse? Uh huh. Yeah, well, we, we, we have done some project, a number of projects together, you know, so, I mean, technologically, you know, where I, I work on one kind of software and she works on another software and we kind of put our things together. And, um, but primarily it's kind of a, um, uh, you know, I, I will make something and I will show it to her and she'll give me notes or feedback and then I'll go back and work on it. She'll make something, show it to me, and I'll give her feedback and she'll work on it. For that, so it's kind of more—it's more like that, where we're kind of working 
working independently and giving feedback to each other. We have started doing some projects where we work together on it, but that's um, that's mostly those are work projects, you know, for for hire for money. But our personal projects we still pretty much work alone. But really, but I mean, I so much of you know, I was um, um, I've been doing things for a while, making movies and animated films and writing books and all that, and, and Beth really made it, um, made me think more seriously about it and say that, you know, if you really want to do this seriously, you have to, um, you have to start sending out to film festivals and you have to do that, and she really encouraged me in that and kind of made, gave me the ability to do the, the career I'm doing now, where I am kind of getting in a few film festivals now and then and, and you know, starting to get my work out a little bit more, and, um, so it's just kind of a, um, Deep inspiration comes from that, that partnership. It's, it's been it's just been great working working with her, having a partner, someone who's really sympathetic, knows knows what I'm knows what I do and what I'm interested in, and you know so and and was able to kind of um, uh, uh, set up a critique, knowing that you know that I'm I'm not trying to make things perfect. I'm not doing Disney animation. I'm doing something that's my own thing. I think. So how is how's it been with that money making part of the business? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's um, yeah, survival. That's what it's all about. I don't, I don't, uh, um, you know, I don't uh, capture animals to eat or, or grow food. You know, and so you have to you have to make some money so you can buy those things. And and, and commit, but it has been working out. You know, one thing is um, one thing that helps is. is you know, as much as possible, trying to live, live a little simply. You know, we, we do a lot of cooking, um, and, and um, you know, we've been we've both been working at the same place for a long time, and both got laid off the same day, and it was suddenly like, oh, we have no income at all, <laughs> and so so we, we basically got into this routine of, of living pretty simply, and just kind of what do we not need to spend money on? Okay, cut that, cut that, cut that. Let's go and get groceries, do a lot of cooking, you know, and just um, and just kind of. Uh, the, the other the other thing that's really helped me is that I'm, um, you know, I'm in, I'm in my fifties now, but I've never had a driver's license, never had a car, and I think a car is the kind of the single most expensive thing that most people have to spend money on. So, so um, you know, I, I don't have to make as much money because I don't have a car. I get around by bike, walk, transit, and um, and get rides. You know, and um, sometimes that makes it harder for me. You know, it takes me a long time sometimes to get to places in the in the suburbs, but. Um, it's definitely uh, given me a little different quality of life than than, um, than drivers, and I think it's been one of the great things in my life that I don't drive. So I think cars are like they not only suck all your money, but they also suck the life and the and the cheerfulness and the um, and um, and the spirit out of it. I mean, I see a lot of people who drive and like it changes them in not a good way. So that's been a really important thing in my life. It's not having a car, not having a driver's license. So what kinds of money-making opportunities open themselves to somebody with your skills and interests? Yeah, well, it's, um, I mean, it's, um, you know, over over the years, I, you know, just know, know people that, Different nonprofit organizations and done videos for them, and 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 then it's just word of mouth. You know, someone says someone's looking for someone to make a video. You know, and and we do it. We um, we've done a lot of videos where we like sneak little bits of animation in them. You know, it's, you know, someone wants a video about um, how to do this, and um, you can get video of it, but also you can make it more clear, even more clear by putting some animation that shows that technique, that process. And so, so we've been. Um, We've just been very lucky to have um, some just some wonderful um, organizations um, that have been willing to pay us to make videos for them. Um, and it's, you know, it's basically, that's, it's just the most amazing thing, really, because you get to find out about a process. You have to really, you kind of have to research it. You have to know it well um, to make a video about it, you know, and you get to meet all the people. You know, you have to, you have to turn that into a story and you have to edit it. Um, and of course, the other thing I've been doing is, is teaching. You know, as I do a lot of work with youth, um, you know, I um, through organizations like Compass and IFP and Intermedia Arts, I've been doing work with youth and, and media work and animation and doing workshops and 
and stuff like that. And, and for me, that is like what it's all about. Because when I was a kid, I made movies, and um, so to me, the most amazing thing I can do is to is to is to kind of present my passion for making movies my way to young people and inspire them to hopefully get them doing that too, like I like I did. So being a being a model. So what have you observed about young filmmakers and animators as a teacher? Yeah. Well, of course, it was just like me when I was when I was little. You know, they're they're influenced by the media. They want to make things that are kind of like what's out there in the media. You know, they're kind of maybe still developing what their what their vision of the world is like. Um, but I see that that same that same passion that I had that they they see stuff in the media and they want to make it back. They want to. They want to make it their own way, and um, and and they uh, get the technology. You know, it's like you can you can um, make movies. You don't need like an eight millimeter camera from someone's attic. You know, that you have to wind up and shoot the film and send it to the uh, drugstore and wait uh, wait a week for it to come back from the processor. You can shoot movies with your phone. You can make animated films with your phone. Um, you can make them on your computer. You know, you can draw them on the computer. You can um, draw them with a mouse. You can. You don't need. Um, a lot of, you know, basically the stuff you have probably around the house is the stuff you need to make a, a movie these days. And there are some, there definitely are youth who are making um, movies. And and, um, and there's that passion with others that they want to do it too. So part of it is just, I mean, part of it is that big thing that, that you want to make it perfect. I mean, that's the, that's the toughest thing is that everyone wants to make their movie perfect because there's all these perfect movies on the TV and the media. And, and, um, and, and kind of the, Hopefully, the biggest thing that I can just present to them is that you just have to make it. That's the most important thing. Is not that it's perfect, but that you actually end up finishing it so you can show it to other people. There's a lot of imperfect media on the, on the internet too, but not all of it is, is worth watching, of course. But uh, yeah. but don't I? I hope that there. Yeah, that people don't let perfection stop them from doing something if they have a good idea and something that they're passionate about. That they want to. Uh, as you look back over the stuff you've done, you talk about having your own ideas and not wanting to compromise as much as say, even somebody like Disney compromised the vision by bringing in other people. What what do you see as the the dominant themes in the stuff you've done? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, you know, I was earlier talking about um, automobiles, but just I mean, uh, one of the themes is just the technologies around us that kind of really run our lives, you know, the things that, um, um, that, 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 uh, that, that run us and ruin us and, and, and keep us from living a full life, you know. So, you know, I've done a number of things about kind of the influence of, of car culture on the minds of, of us. Um, you know, and done things about how like riding bicycles free me up. So transportation issues are something that's always important to me. I'm also I'm really interested in, in just how how people live, how cities are set up. You know, what uh, you know, I have this animated feature that I'm finishing up that's about the Minneapolis Gateway District and how how people lived. You know, in the early part of the the 20th century and you know, in the, kind of the dense. Um, a traditional city, you know, that was then eliminated for you know surface parking lots and and this kind of vision of what a future city would be like, which was you know, um, something that maybe was a little more antiseptic. So kind of how people live has been important, you know? and and just kind of nonsense. Sure, nonsense has been something that's really been important to me. That ability to just say that. Um, this world is crazy, so um, let's just admit it sometimes and just be a little crazy too. So, and maybe if we have a moment, I could do, I could do another little reading. Sure. Okay. So this is one that I'm actually gonna um, I'm gonna do tomorrow night at, the, at this cabaret. So I actually I have it so I can all set up. So this is a a piece called the book that I reviewed reviewed me back. So it's a little little literary piece. It's a basically a a, a, a um, uh, um, you know, a little uh, a story that kind of will help you live your life. Kind of a good, uh, what do you call those? Those kind of stories that really uh, 
cautionary tales. That's what it is. Good cautionary tales. So you don't have to learn things the hard way by making mistakes. Hear the cautionary tale and review life that way. So it's called the book I reviewed reviewed me back. Okay. So I said those words on Amazon. I cannot take them back. Like weak and slim and underwhelmed and seriously has a lack. I wrote those words about that book I never finished reading, went back to life and sleep and work, an occasional garden reading. My friend told me after a beer that he had bumped into it, just browsing here and there and yawn, that's usually how you do it. He saw my name, he told me straight after beer number two, that book that you, you reviewed, well, it wrote a review of you. I googled up my name and found, among the old court cases, the comments of which my acquaintance spoke, planted in several places. That book that said I couldn't read, my, that book said that I couldn't read, my attention frequently wandered, advised all books to stay away, that time with me was squandered. That I didn't appreciate the pacing or the plot. I couldn't keep the characters straight. My breathing smelled of rot. I completely missed one chapter when I placed my bookmark wrong. And instead of pondering irony, my brain fixed on some song. I know reviews are helpful when you're considering a purchase, but I might hold off the next time I have review writing urges. I'm feeling Sheepish nowadays, I'm not a thick-skinned man. I'm beginning to regret those words I wrote about my ceiling fan. So just imagine someone writing a book review and the, and the book reviewing him back. I mean, it really is a two-way street. You know, you, you, um, there's the media, the books that you read, the TV shows that you watch, you know, and of course they present themselves to you, but you know, you have a responsibility as the consumer too to put the story together and to, and to stay awake and to not miss that chapter and not to not to lose track of those characters and so so this is a little little fantasy of someone getting a review from the book that they review. So these are on the order of comic books. Yeah, uh -huh, yeah. yeah. Uh, is there it must be a, a different order of magnitude step to move on to uh, animated films mm -hmm. where where you have to get things to move yeah yeah do you do, what yeah. how do you think about that I mean do you do, is that a sort of project you want to invest in or yeah I mean I do I do I do comics I mean I think so many of my animated films are really just they're kind of moving comics you know so you know there's the different panels of the these, these little poems you know um, the um, so many of the animated films I've made that I've been making recently are the silly poems I write illustrated. So they just, you hear me reading them and then you see the images and they, instead of just being a static image, they'll move around, you know. So um, there's definitely some pieces that I've uh, written that are more that are more for the written word than, than are more visual, you know, but um, but when I when I write these things, you know, I see I see them visually and um, some of them, some of them end up just comics, and some of them end up as animated films. Slightly more of them have been ending up animated films than comics, but I still do occasional comics. That animated films I can put up on YouTube and get them out and send them to film festivals. The comic side, you know, just basically uh, pile up. <laughs> you know, so they, it's harder to do. I find I'm, you know, because I, it's just one more thing to kind of self-publish them and get them out. I, I, made books, like I said, since I was, since I could read, I've made little books, and that's, you know, and I still write books, I've written, you know, several novels, you know, but I, you know, but what you do with that is a little bit harder for me, I, I know I can make a movie, and I can put it online, and get it out, you know, so, yeah, so it's, but it is, it's all related, it's all kind of a to me. Well, these days, what does it take to make an animated film? It doesn't take it doesn't take much really. It takes time, you know. It takes time and it takes persistence. But um, you know, what what animated films are is that you know when you're watching me, I am a picture that's moving. But I'm really not a picture that's moving. I'm a whole bunch of still frames, one after the other. I am an animated film myself. I'm a whole bunch mm -hmm. of still frames of me, and 
and um, by now the camera is taking them continuously. But really, it could it could be um, you know if we were going to do this very slowly, I could like pose for a picture. You could take that picture. I could pose for another one. You could take that picture. We could make that same movie with me, just exactly like this, but very slowly. And that's what an animated film is. It's like taking a video, but doing it very slowly. And and there's software that helps you do that. You know, I have a little setup in my house where I have a camera, tabletop. I can take a picture, move things around, take another picture. And then there's software, there's like Flash, where you can draw things on the computer, and you can um, uh, set those those frames for where things move, and all in the computer, moving things around with your with your mouse. And um, you know, you can uh, get Flash really easily. There's even free versions of things like it. There's um, there's Photoshop. You can animate with Photoshop. Really, you just need. Um, and, and on my phone, I have a stop motion animation program. I can make movies with my phone. You, all you need, really, is an idea. You need an excuse to take those things out and use those tools. And, um, and coming up with ideas is something, when I do those workshops with kids, we just pre-associate some words and put them together and figure out how do we turn them into a story. You know, you, the, all you need is these things around you. And you put them together and figure out weird ways to combine them suddenly you have a story and suddenly you have a reason to use those tools to make that animated film that, that everything around you is, is wanting you to make. You know, the technology is there, you can do it. Thinking about where you started with the 8mm, where you ended up. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, think of that distance. Mm -hmm. And then wondering what the comparable distance would be for someone who's just mm -hmm. discovering Photoshop and the possibility of the iPhone and yeah, uh, yeah, no, such like that today. Where where is it going to go? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's you need a science fiction writer for that. You know, I mean, it's is it is it all going to come straight out of your brain? To me, that's not so interesting. You know, you, I mean, it does come out of your brain, anyway, but, but um, yeah, it's kind of unbelievable that yeah that um, it was the, the physical film moving through the camera, and I had to kind of click the button fast to get a short exposure, and, and I had to know about light, you know, when I shot my first roll and it was dark, I didn't, I had to figure out how to, to light things, I had to figure out how to open the iris, and, and now you really don't have to worry about those things, a lot of those are on automatic on the cameras, you know, and, and I don't know, that's, I could dream about what what it might be like, but, um, but I don't know, I, I'm just kind of interested to see what it I love those old technologies, you know, and I still like to play around with my own old film cameras and things like that. I love the new technologies, but where it's going, I don't know. Hopefully, um, I mean, one thing about the new technologies are th things become more and more ephemeral. You know, that the, when you shot some, I'm, the films that I shot when I was nine years old, you know, that's like 40 years ago, those films are still viewable. You can still, I can still thread them up in the projector and they look pretty much like they looked when I first shot them, they were maybe a little dusty, or maybe the colors faded a little bit. You know, the stuff that kids make today, though, um, on their computer, you know, what's that going to be like in 40 years? They're probably not going to be able to play it back. You know, there's probably going to be no technology that can play it back. I don't know. You know, so um, the the media, you know, videotape didn't last as long as film. You know, film's pretty archivable. Videotape, you know, deteriorates, hard drives die, you know. That's the, the thing is, are things going to like you make something and it's going to vanish immediately and be gone forever? You know, that's that's what I fear. You know, things are going in that direction because it, to me it's all about memory. And my old movies are my memory. You know, that's how I look back at things as I see those things I did in the past. I see those stories I wrote, the movies I made. Um, but but yeah, if you um, shoot something and you won't have access to it years later, you know what? Memories you're going to have to, they're going to have to come through your head or something. Or from, or from who is ever archiving the internet, which is. Um, you know. Oh, was that a thought when you started that you might not remember this, you'd better make a movie? <laughs> no, no, but there's so many things in my life that I only remember because I shot a movie of it, or that movie makes me remember something else, or that photograph reminds me of something. You know, it's um, it's a horrible crutch. I mean, it, you know, I, you know, I wish I had stronger memories, but I don't. But the 
the, a lot of memories I have are, are at least triggered strongly by those movies and the experiences around them. You know, I never thought about that at the time. For me, I just wanted to make it and do this thing. But now both of my parents are gone, and I have records of them. You know, I have recordings and things of them, and those are, you know, of course I have memories which I have always access to. I always have access to those. I don't always have access to the recordings I made, but but those are those reminders are important. To uh, you know, I wish I would have gotten more stories of them telling stories and things like that. I don't, I don't have that. I really treasure what I have because my memory is, is, is very fallible and very and isn't as concrete as they met the movie, and that's really what they said, pretty much. You know, the shot I got, you know, but, uh, but memory is like, oh, I don't remember that exactly, or was that a memory, or was that a dream, or was something I heard, or something that I actually experienced? I can't remember now. You know, so it's um, for me, yeah, my movies and my writing and things like that are, are a big part of how I come to remember things. Did you do uh, Did you do documentaries of like your parents as a kid? You... No, I mean I shot home movies. You know, I shot movies of us mostly on trips and things like that. You know, so and I, you know, and. You know, you think your parents are going to be around forever. So I, you know, I did. I did later. I got them saying a few stories, but you know, both my parents died kind of, kind of young. So I, you know, I, um, I didn't get as much as I would like to. I, I would, you know, if I would have thought about it more. I would have wanted to sit them down and have them talk about their whole life and have that recorded. You know, not that I want to. You know, of course, then you have to go through it. So it's probably just fine what I, what I have. Some of my. Um, Great aunts. I had I had a couple of my great aunts sit down and go through their scrapbooks and their photo albums and just tell me about their lives. And I have those records. I don't have those of my parents. Those were great aunts who were in their 90s, <laughs> so my parents didn't make it that, that long. Um, but um, but you know, but the most important thing is the real memory in your, your brain anyway. Um, maybe it's just a little crunch to that will spark those. Other memories. We had any luck. Per persuading the students you teach to document the things they wish that they will wish they document <laughs> yeah. when they're fifty. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I you know, I mean, I, I today. I mean, I see young people. There's things like Instagram where people are taking photos all the time and putting them online and sharing them. So, so people are documenting that. But are they archiving it? Are they saving them in a, in a fashion, a way that they can? Access it, you know, 30 years later. I don't, I don't know if that's going to be possible. Who knows? Um, um, uh, yeah, but I, I and mean, that's not anything that I really, I mean, that's a very important thing, you know, thinking about, you know, right now. I'm not thinking about what's 20 years ahead of this. You know, I, it's, that's not how my brain works anyway. I'm thinking about what's going on right now. So, so right. But now, when I look back at those films that I shot earlier, the things I wrote and made when I was earlier, it, it gives me a real, a real uh, window into who I was and what my world was like when I was that age. And now I can really value that I took the time to do those things. You know, I had no idea. I had, you know, I, I couldn't imagine myself as an old man. It's little necessarily. You know. I had fantasies, I had dreams of what I might be like, but you know, I ended up nothing like that. I didn't really, I had not, didn't really think we were sticking to that. In the future, I was doing all those things. It was about just expressing myself, about doing stuff that I thought was fun. So, what kind of time does creative activity take in your, in your day these days? Yeah, well, it usually takes a lot of my time. I usually spend some time in the morning. Um, I may, you know, do some writing early on, you know, either write a silly poem or I, you know, I have ongoing writing projects that I do. Often the writing comes first and then I um, might do, um, I might do some drawing, uh, I have animation projects. I kind of do all those in the morning before I kind of go on to my, my work work, which is really creative work too. It's the video production and animation work I do for a living, you know, usually starting at nine. Um, and then, you know, on weekends and evenings I might do some more of my own creative work, but you know, I think it's a it's a big part of my my day. You know, um, yeah, I 
guess that's a sign that maybe I don't have a huge social life, but I'm also an introvert, you know, so I like to, I like to just sort of be at home and making my things, you know, too. That's just kind of important. That's something that just really makes me feel, feel good, you know, it's something that I can do where I can just, you know, um, I mean, it's like almost a spiritual thing, you know, where I just, I can just kind of reach this, this state that goes beyond life in my daily life and get outside of my, you know, get away from my body and, and just kind of feel this, this um, ecstasy of, of, of doing something that's, that just fulfills me so much. I've been doing a stop motion piece that's pretty intense. I'm just kind of moving things around a little bit, taking a picture, and it's, and it's just really, it's, uh, it's been a really wonderful experience. When I'm doing this kind of uh, work that I do with the, with the um, I make a comic with the, with the I use, uh, you know, a nib, dipping it in India ink, you know, and, and using a brush to paint, you know, it's a, it's a thing that my brain turns off and I just get into that ecstatic moment of doing it. So, um, I like to do it as much as I, as I can. And what, what nourishes you? Where do you get ideas and inspiration and encouragement to go on? Yeah, yeah. Well, I get well encouragement, of course, from Beth, my partner, and from friends who, who like say they like the stuff that I do. Um, I um, um, and ideas just you know. I mean, sometimes you have to you have to work for them. I mean, sometimes you have to just kind of like okay. I mean, one exercise I've often done is just. I look and say, okay, glass, and then I look over here and I say, uh, clay, and then I'll try to put them together and figure out what the story is when those words come together, you know. Um, um, you know, just, and sometimes I'll have a dream and I'll wake up and think, oh, there's a basis, there's a start of something, you know, or, or um, I mean, the, the main thing, though, is just, you know, kind of starting with an idea. I have, you know, this animated feature I've been working on for several years, and it just started, that I wanted to do something about, um, about, um, the uh, uh, urban renewal, you know, where whole neighborhoods would be taken out and replaced with parking lots or something like that. And, and eventually I would like add, okay, here's a character who does this. Oh, here's a character who does this. Oh, maybe that, I have, I, here's a character, I don't know what they're going to do. And then later I realized this is what that character does, you know. And just over years, and it took years for this whole story to develop, you know, and some of it was just kind of thinking about it now and then some of it was actually going and like just right, you know, for a lot of things, I do. I will do some writing. You know, do a bunch of writing where I just kind of just write whatever and reassociate. And eventually, those those free associations turn into something that's a little stronger. You know, it's just ideas just build up. I mean, it's something that's it's it is work. It's work. You know, sometimes there are ideas that are gifts, but often you have to you have to work at it. Um, so you've had a career kind of at the edges of of animation at the edges of filmmaking. Uh, you ever wish you'd gone into it full bore? <laughs> no. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, because I, you know, yeah, I, yeah, what you're saying kindly is that I've had no success or very little success, which is, well, which is probably... Well, well, I wouldn't put it that way, and I have reason not to put it that <laughs> yeah, way, being yeah. in an enterprise <laughs> yeah. that I've also kind of had at the edge. I, I'm thinking more you know, you didn't, you didn't try, you, you didn't say, I want to go to film school and become Scorsese, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, I'm Scorsese gonna... probably didn't say that either. I mean, but, he, I mean, he really did things out of love and, and through, and through tenacity and like, I mean, one of some, like people, those successful people like Scorsese and Disney, what they have and what I don't have is they have salesmanship. They can really sell themselves really well. I, I just can't do that, you know. So, um, you know, of course, yeah, I mean, I think anyone who creates things wants people to, to, to see them and they seek an audience. But of course, there's there's downsides of that. If you have a big audience, you have a um, you have you know people who love you and people who hate your you and you know. And to me, it's um, to me. You know, I do things because I love to do it because I like to do it. And and you know, I definitely appreciate it when people when people see things and they like them. And um, and um, but. You know, there's a lot of pressure that goes with being successful, and I don't have to deal with that pressure too. So, yeah. so um, I um, just that I can I've been able to do things my way and be able to develop it over years and years. Doing it my way um, is something that um, I really I really value too. Thank you. <laughs>